Hello, Linear Algebra students. This video lesson is on the topic of general vector spaces. Now, a general vector space is a set, V, of objects, loosely called vectors, with two operations. One is an addition, and I put addition in quotes of objects, because we can define addition in a variety of ways. And two, scalar multiplication. Again, multiplication is in quotes because we can define multiplication in various ways and for which the following axioms are true for all objects u, v, w in the set v, and for all scalars a, b in the real number system. Now up to this point, we've been discussing vector spaces as opposed to general vector spaces, and vector spaces were sets of vectors in Rn. But now we're going to consider sets of objects where those objects aren't necessarily vectors in Rn. So those objects could be matrices, they could be scalars, they could be polynomials, they could be vectors still, they could be a variety of mathematical objects. Now because we're using the term addition and scalar multiplication loosely, we need more general notations to represent the results of the operations. So in the case of object addition, we're going to use this symbol that you see right here. Object addition just has to be an operation that acts on two different objects from the set V, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you do addition in the traditional sense. For example, let's say the objects U and V are both vectors in R2, and our general object addition might mean to only add the first components, but not to add the second components, or perhaps to subtract the second components while adding the first components. So the operation can be defined basically any way you would like. The other notation we're going to see is scalar multiplication, but in a general sense. And so we'll use the star that you see here to represent scalar object multiplication. So the A is a scalar and a U is the an object from the set V. So the scalars are limited to being real numbers, but the objects from V can be basically any mathematical idea. And then we define scalar object multiplication in any way we would like. For example, a scalar times a vector in R2, we might define as the scalar only multiplies to the second component, but not to the first component. So because of our freedom to define these two operations any way we like, we need these different notations to represent these more general operations. Now the first condition, however it is we've defined object addition, if you take two objects from the vector space and quote unquote add them together. And moving forward, I will simply say add when referring to object object addition. But you should interpret that word add or the word sum as general and not necessarily in the traditional sense. So two objects in V, if when added together, you get a result that's still an object in V, then we say that the set is closed under object addition. Number two, object addition is commutative. So u plus v must equal v plus u. Number three, object addition is associative. So if you have three objects being added together, you can perform the operations in either order. So in this case, we would add u and v first, get a result, and then add that result to w second. And if we go in the other order, where we add v and w first, get a result, and then add that result to u, if we get the same result guaranteed every time for all u and v and w in this set capital V, then we say that the operation of object addition is associative. Number four, there exists a zero object, so a bold zero that's in the set, such that any vector u from the set when added to this zero object does not change the vector u. If v is a set of scalars, then this zero object is simply the scalar zero. If v is a set of vectors in, say, R3, then this zero object would be a three-component zero vector, etc. Number five, each object u has an quote-unquote opposite, and again, we use that word generally. Its notation will be negative sign of the object u, such that u plus negative u will give us the zero object. So in the case of scalars, if u was the scalar 3, then its opposite object 
would be the scalar negative 3, and when you add them together, you get the zero object for scalars, which is simply the number zero. Number six, closure under scalar multiplication. So if u is any object in v and a is any scalar in r, then a times u needs to be in the set capital V as well. And again, I use the word times loosely. So when I say product, multiplication, or times, we are talking about a general sense, not necessarily the traditional sense. Number seven, the distributive property. So a times the sum of u and v, a needs to be able to distribute. So you would have to get a times u and then plus a times v. A second distributive property. If you have a sum of two scalars, now this sum right here, notice it's the regular plus symbol. That's because a and b are scalars, they're real numbers, and we will assume that those operate on each other with the traditional addition. So if you do a plus b and then multiply a plus b times the object u, you basically need to be able to distribute u from the right side and get the result a times u plus b times u. The next property, scalar associativity. If you have two scalars being multiplied to an object, and if you multiply scalar b to the object first and get a new object, and then multiply that new object by scalar a second, you need to get the exact same result as if you multiply the two scalars first, get a new scalar, and then do our scalar multiplication to the object u. And then finally, the scalar identity equation must hold. So if you take the scalar 1 and do your scalar object multiplication with the object u, it needs to give you u back always. Okay, so if a set with two operations, addition and scalar multiplication, satisfies all 10 of these axioms or all 10 of these properties, then we call that set a general vector space. Now looking at the bottom here, note that the set of vectors in Rn with normal vector addition and scalar multiplication that satisfies conditions 1 and 6 will automatically satisfy the remaining conditions, and thus will be a vector space. Now, in earlier lessons, when our objects were vectors in Rn, to show that we were working with a vector space, we simply had to show that the set was closed under vector addition and that it was closed under scalar multiplication, which is conditions 1 and 6. If equations 1 and 6 are true, then the other 8 were automatically true given our normal operations of vector addition and scalar multiplication. Now consider the set of vectors in R2 that originate at the origin and terminate on the line y equals 2x. So this would be the set of all vectors where the y-coordinate is twice the x-coordinate. This is a vector space, and we know that because the graph will be a line through the origin. And in fact, we could define this vector space using our span terminology. It's going to be the span of, and let's use as a basis a non-zero vector that's on this line. So whatever x is, say 1, y has to be twice that. So the span of this vector will produce this vector space. Let's test all 10 of these conditions for this set of vectors. So in this case, our objects are vectors. So a bold u, I'm going to write in vector notation. I'll write u with the arrow above it. And it, we're going to keep a general example here. So let's say that it has an x-coordinate. We'll say x1. And the y-coordinate should be twice this in order to be in this space. So it'll be 2x1. And a second vector, we'll say v, is equal to, we'll say x2 is the first component. And to be in this set, the second coordinate has to be twice that. Okay, let's test for condition 1, which is closure under object addition. So we know that if we take the objects vector u plus vector v, so the first component will be x1 plus x2, and the second component will be 2x1 plus 2x2. Well, because there's a 2 in both terms in that second component, we can factor out the 2. And we see that we have a vector of the form where the second component is twice the first component. This means that this will be in the vector space. That means for this particular set of vectors, we do have closure under object addition. Now, the, the next two axioms are true given that our object addition is just traditional vector addition. So we know that the order in which we add two vectors doesn't matter. So u plus v is equal to v plus u. Also, we know 
that normal vector addition is associative. So if you have three vectors being added together, it won't matter if you add the first two together first, u and v, and then add w to that result, or if you add v and w first, get a result, and then add that to vector u. Let me skip ahead to property six, the closure under scalar multiplication. We know that if you take any scalar and you multiply it by a vector in this set, so that has the form x to x, regular scalar vector multiplication would distribute the a to all the components. So we would have as our first component ax and as our second component 2ax. And the second component is still twice the value of the first component. So this result is still in this set. So this gives us closure under scalar multiplication. Furthermore, if our scalar is 0 and I multiply a vector in the set by 0, I get the 0 vector. This 0 vector is in the set because we have closure. And it's also a vector such that when added to other vectors, you don't change it. So the zero vector is our zero object. So we have a bold zero to stand more generally for the zero object, but in the case of these two-dimensional vectors, it's the zero vector. So its components are zero, zero. This is an object that's in this set because it's on the line y equals 2x, and it's true that the second coordinate is twice the value of the first coordinate. Furthermore, if we take any vector u and add the zero vector to it, we will get the vector u back. Now looking at condition 5, if you take any vector that's in this set, so it has the form x to x, its opposite is we distribute a negative 1, and we get negative x and negative 2x. This is still in our set v, because the second component is twice the value of the first component. And it's true that when added together, the components cancel, and we get the zero vector back. And every vector in this set has an opposite that's still in the set. Remember, it's important that the opposite be in the set if the original object was in the set. Continuing, let's look at property 7, the first distributive property. Given regular scalar multiplication and regular addition of vectors, if you take a scalar and you multiply it by a sum of two vectors, we do have the scalar distributes. So it'll be a times vector u plus a times vector v. The second distributive property is also true, given that we have regular operations. So a plus b times a vector will be equal to a times that vector plus b times that vector. Also, scalar associativity will be true given regular operations. So a times b u. So if you multiply all the components of u by b first and then multiply all the components after that by a second, then you can also multiply a and b together first and then distribute that through the components of u. And the scalar identity. If we just do 1 times a vector in all the traditional sense of multiplication, we just get the vector back. So in the end, all of these conditions are satisfied, and we have a vector space. But before this lesson, when we were working with sets of vectors, then we only had to test conditions 1 and 6 in order to be a vector space. That's because the other conditions were guaranteed to be true, either under the merits of the operations or as a consequence of both 1 and 6 being true. For example, 2 and 3 are true regardless of whether 1 and 6 are true. But because 6 is true, that will imply that 4 has to be true. Because to be closed under scalar multiplication, 0 times a vector would give us a 0 vector, and that's the, the 0 object. Also, because we're closed under scalar multiplication, multiplying a vector by negative 1 is how you find this opposite vector. And it's guaranteed to be in the set because of condition 6 is true. And then the remaining 4 here were true under the merits of the standard operations. And they are true regardless of whether conditions 1 and 6 are true. So in summary, when working with sets of vectors in Rn, the blue conditions were always true, given the standard operations of vector addition and scalar multiplication. The green ones were true if 6 was true. So all we had to do to prove that we were working with a vector space was to show that conditions 1 and 6 were satisfied for the given set of vectors. But as we move forward to general sets where the objects aren't necessarily vectors and the operations aren't necessarily defined in the traditional sense, it will be important to verify all 10 of these statements. All right, let's move on to the next page. Determine if the set with operations below forms a general vector space. 
So we're going to call this set V, even if it's not necessarily going to wind up being a vector space. This set V is equal to all polynomials of degree 2 or less, where polynomial addition and scalar multiplication are as normal. First notice on this slide, I've switched to the normal symbol for addition of objects. That's because I now know that I'm working with traditional addition of polynomials. But bold U and bold V stand for two different polynomials. It's difficult to write bold letters by hand, so I'm going to say bold U moving forward will just be P sub 1 standing for the first polynomial. And this is a degree 2 or less polynomial, so it has general form. We'll say A sub 1 times X squared plus B sub 1 times X plus C sub 1, where A, B, and C, where the coefficients here, are any real numbers, including potentially 0. So if A is 0, and but B is not, then we would have a first degree polynomial, and that would still be in the set, because this set is all polynomials of degree 2 or less. So we can allow for A to be 0 and reduce the degree to 1, or both A and B to be 0 to reduce the degree to 0. In fact, if all of them are zero, then we simply get the polynomial is the zero function, which is still a polynomial of degree two or less. In vector v, the bold v, we'll say is a second polynomial, which will be a sub two times x squared plus b sub two times x plus c sub two. Now, if we add these together under normal polynomial addition, we would add similar terms, and then I could factor out the x squared. So you would get a one plus a two times x squared, and add the similar terms in the middle, the x terms, so b1 plus b2, and factor out the x, and then the constants would add and become c1 plus c2. But notice this has the form, once again, of just a polynomial of degree 2 or less. Now, it might be less if, say, a1 and a2 canceled each other, hence canceling the x squared term. But certainly the result here is guaranteed to be a polynomial of degree 2 or less, therefore it is in the set v as were the polynomials P1 and P2 individually. So we do have closure under addition of the objects. All right, the second condition. If you take two polynomials and add them together in the traditional meaning of addition, then it really doesn't matter the order in which you add them. So we do have the commutative property satisfied. The associative property, similar. If you take any three polynomials and add them together, we do it in a few different ways. So if we add P1 and P2 together first and then add P3 to that, we'll get the same result that we'll get if we add P2 and P3 together first and then add P1 to that. So this will be associative under regular addition. Condition four, does there exist a zero object such that U plus zero will give you U back? Well, yes, that zero object is simply the zero constant polynomial. So in this case here, this zero object, the bold zero, is simply the zero scalar. But this is a zero degree polynomial, so it's in V, because V is a set of all polynomials of degree 2 or less. Also, if you take any polynomial P and add 0 to it, it'll stay that polynomial P. So we have a 0 object in the set. Number 5, there exists an opposite object for every object in the set. So if you have some polynomial, and that polynomial is has the form AX squared plus BX plus C, its opposite will be just multiply the polynomial by negative 1 and distribute. So it'll be negative AX squared minus BX minus C. And if the first polynomial is in V because it's degree 2 or less, then certainly this second one will be in V because it's also degree 2 or less. And furthermore, when you add them together, all the terms do cancel out and we get this zero object back, which is simply the zero scalar in this case. So condition 5 holds. Every object in the set has an opposite in the set. That, when added together, gives you the zero object that we talked about in condition 4. Okay, let's look at condition 6, talk about scalar multiplication. If we take any scalar a and multiply it by a polynomial, let's use our p1 notation. Polynomial 1, we said a sub 1 x squared plus b sub 1 x plus c sub 1. We distribute the a and we get a times a sub 1 x squared plus a times b sub 1 x plus a times c sub 1. But this certainly is still a degree 2 or less polynomial, even if a is 0. If a is 0, we get the 0 polynomial back which is still in the set V. So this will always be in our set. Thus, we have closure under scalar multiplication. Number seven, the distributive property. Again, because these operations are tr traditional operations, if you take a sum of two polynomials, which are objects in the set V, multiply by a scalar, we know that we can distribute the scalar to both of the polynomials. So we're going to get the distributive property one holding true always. 
Similarly, distributive property 2 will always hold true. If you have a sum of two scalars and you multiply by some polynomial, that that polynomial can distribute. Scalar associativity is also true. If you have a polynomial and you multiply it by b, you get a new polynomial, and then multiply that by a, you'll get the same result as if you first multiply a and b, and then multiply by the polynomial. And then last condition, if you take the scalar 1 and multiply it by a polynomial, you will simply get that polynomial back. So stepping back and looking at this set, this does form a general vector space, because all 10 conditions are satisfied. So V is a general vector space. Okay, let's go to the next page. On this page, we have a very similar set, but there is an important distinction. This time we're saying V is all polynomials of exactly degree 2, so not degree 2 or less. But again, where polynomial addition and scalar multiplication are as normal. We begin by testing for closure. If you take two polynomials that are exactly degree 2 and add them together, ask yourself, is it guaranteed that the result will also be exactly degree 2? Turns out the answer is no. The guarantee isn't there. Let's come up with a counterexample. So suppose we have the degree 2 polynomial negative x squared plus x plus 1. And to this, we add a degree 2 polynomial x squared plus x plus 1. Both of these are in the set because they are degree 2 exactly. However, when you add them together, the leading terms do cancel each other. And the result is 2x plus 2. But this is not a degree 2 polynomial. It's a degree 1. And so the result is not in the set V. Therefore, this set is not closed under addition. We'll put an x by that. Now, as soon as we have any one of the 10 conditions failing, then we can conclude right away that this set is not going to be a vector space. But let's go ahead and verify whether the remaining conditions are true or false in this case. Commutative property. If you take two degree two polynomials and add them together, we're not focused on closure here, so it doesn't matter if we get cancellation of the leading terms. All we're checking is that whether this addition of polynomials operation is commutative, and it's certainly the case because our addition operation is as normal. So we do have commutative addition of polynomials, same thing will be true for this associative property if we're working with polynomials. And regular addition, associative property, will be true. Now these two properties, 2 and 3, are entirely dependent on the operation of the addition. And if it's traditional addition, then certainly a commutative and associative will be true. Now condition 4. Is there a zero object in this set? So in other words, a polynomial of exactly degree 2, such that when you add it to another polynomial of degree 2, it does not change that second polynomial. Now, in the case of polynomial addition, the only polynomial that when added to any other polynomial without changing that polynomial has to be the zero scalar, or the zero degree zero polynomial. So if this statement here is to be true, this would imply that the zero object, the bold zero, has to be the zero scalar. However, the zero scalar is not in this set because it's a degree zero polynomial, and this set only contains exactly degree 2 polynomials. So condition 4 will fail. When condition 4 fails, condition 5 is on shaky ground, because condition 5 suggests that every object in the set has to have an opposite, such that when added together you get the zero object. But the zero object is not even in this set. If you take a polynomial that is in this set, it would have the general form ax squared plus bx plus c, but this time we have to put a condition on a where a is non-zero. To ensure that this is a degree 2, we can't let a be 0. The opposite of this would be negative a x squared minus bx minus c, and negative a, therefore, would not be 0 either. So both of these polynomials would be in the set v. However, when you add them together, we get the 0 polynomial, which is not in the set v. So we could say that condition 5 is true the way it's stated, there is a polynomial P, which has an opposite, and both of them are in the set V. And it is true that when you add them together, you get the zero object. So we can make a case that condition 5 holds true while condition 4 fails. Or we can argue that condition 4 and 5 could be a joint condition that must be both satisfied. So there not only has to exist a zero object in the set, but every object in the set has an opposite that when added together, you get this zero object back. So jointly, conditions 4 and 5 fail. 
And it won't matter. If any one condition fails, then we do not call the set a vector space. So we're starting to get a sense that these 10 conditions aren't necessarily disjoint. They are interrelated. If one fails, it causes issues with others. Let's look at closure under scalar multiplication. So u is a polynomial, and if we take any polynomial in the set and multiply it by any scalar, we have to be guaranteed that the result is still in the set. However, the scalar a can be any real number, including 0. So that's certainly a scalar you want to test out here. If you take the scalar 0 and multiply it by any polynomial, you will get the 0 scalar back. But this is not in our set v because it's not a degree 2 polynomial. So for this one counterexample alone, we can say that the set is not closed under scalar multiplication. Now the next four are solely dependent on what the operations were. They're independent of whether the set was closed under either operation. But because we're working with standard addition of polynomials and standard scalar polynomial multiplication, it's going to turn out that all of these conditions are satisfied. So distributive property 1 will be true. Distributive property 2 will be true. The scalar associativity property will be true. And certainly, 1 times a polynomial will still be that polynomial. We have true, 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 and true. So taking a step back, but of course any one red x in this list will disqualify the set from being a vector space. So our conclusion, v is not a general vector space. All right, going on to the next slide. Determine if the set with operations below forms a general vector space. This time our set is a collection of 2x2 two two invertible matrices, where matrix addition and scalar multiplication are as normal. To test condition 1, closure under addition, in this case under matrix addition. If you were to take two 2x2 two two invertible matrices and add them together, is the resultant matrix guaranteed to also be invertible? We can come up with a very simple counterexample to this claim. For example, the identity matrix. This is invertible, so this is in our set V. And we can add to that the opposite of the identity matrix, which is also by itself invertible. Both of these matrices have non-zero determinants, therefore they are invertible. But when you add them together, we produce the zero matrix. And the zero matrix is not in V because it has a zero determinant, therefore it's not invertible. So right here we can see that this set is not closed under matrix addition. Now conditions two and three are independent of this finding. Under normal matrix addition, if you take any matrix plus any other matrix, capital B, we've already explored this and we know that matrix addition is commutative. Now matrix multiplication is not, but matrix addition is. So condition two will be satisfied. We also know that matrix addition is associative. So if you have three matrices added together, A plus B plus C, and we do this sum two different ways by, in one case we add A and B first and then add C, in the other case we add B and C first and then add A, that we do always get the same result. Matrix addition is associative. So is matrix multiplication for that matter. But now we're just focused on matrix addition. There exists a zero object in this set of matrices such that any object in the set, so any matrix, plus the zero object has to give you that matrix back. Well, if this statement here is going to be true, that this implies that this zero object must be the zero matrix. This is the only 2 by 2 matrix that when you add it to another 2 by 2 matrix, you're guaranteed not to change it. But the problem is this zero object, or the zero matrix here, is not in our set because it is not invertible. So condition 4 fails. So condition 5, we could say that there's no point in even checking it, once condition 4 fails, 5 is irrelevant to test. Let's go ahead and consider it anyway. Do there exist opposites of matrices? And the answer would be yes. If you take any matrix of the form A, B, C, D, of course is a 2 by 2 matrix, and we're going to say it's in the set V, meaning that it is invertible, we'll assume. It does have an opposite, which would be the opposite of this matrix. Distributing a negative 1, it'd be negative A, negative B, negative C, and negative D. If the first matrix is invertible, then the opposite of it was also invertible. And when you add them together, you do get this zero matrix back. So this is the zero object. So technically, if you look at statement five in isolation, it is satisfied. But it's a mute point because that zero matrix is not even in the set. Condition four failed. And condition four fails because essentially that's connected to the idea that this set is not closed under addition. It's possible to add invertible matrices and get a non-invertible matrix back. Let's look at condition six. Closure under scalar multiplication. If you take an invertible matrix and scale it by some non-zero amount, the result will still be invertible. But again, the scalar zero is a problem. 
you take zero and scale to any two by two invertible matrix, you will get the zero matrix back. But this is not in our set V. Therefore, we do not have closure under scalar multiplication. Zero is the only scalar for which we have a problem in this case. Now the remaining four properties are all going to be true. True, 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 because all of them are independent of the closure ideas and they're dependent entirely on the operations. And since we're working with normal matrix addition and normal scalar matrix multiplication, all of these properties do wind up being true. The distributive property, take any scalar and multiply it by the sum of two matrices, and you can distribute and multiply that scalar by A, matrix A, plus that scalar times matrix B, and then add the results. Distributive property two will also be true. Take any two scalars, A plus B, multiply it by a matrix A, and you can effectively distribute the matrix and do scalar A times matrix A plus scalar B times matrix A, and then add the results after the fact and get the same result. Scalar associativity will be true. If you take a matrix and multiply it by a scalar B, get a new matrix, and then scale that by a scalar A, you'll get the exact same result as if you first multiply A and B and then multiply that scalar through the matrix A. And the scalar identity. You take the real number one and multiply it to a matrix, you will get that same matrix back. So again, we have three red X's, but all it takes is one red X to disqualify this set from being a vector space. So once again, V is not a general vector space. Okay, let's move on to the next page. On this page, we're going to explore object addition and scalar object multiplication that are not in the normal sense. And let's go back to a set of vectors in R2. So V will be all vectors in R2. However, we are going to define vector addition in the following way. If you take any two vectors, so vector one, and then add to vector two, using this definition of addition, we get a new vector where the first component is as expected, you just add them, but we're going to say that the second component is actually the difference, y1 minus y2. Furthermore, we're going to define scalar multiplication in an atypical way. So we'll use the star. So the star suggests if we do scalar a star, or just loss a times, times the vector xy, that the scalar will only distribute to the first component, but not the second component. Now let's explore all 10 properties given these atypical operations. Testing closure. So my first vector we'll say is x1, y1, written as a column vector. And we'll add to this vector 2, which has components x2, y2. And according to the definition of this operation addition, we get a result where we only add the first components, but we subtract in this order the second components. So the first vector is a two-dimensional vector, therefore it is in R2. The second vector is also in R2. And this result, of course, is also in R2. So we do have closure under addition defined in this way. Let's test for commutativity. Let's use the same example we did above, but let's add them in the reverse order. So the second vector and the first vector will switch places. And the new result will be we get x2 plus x1. And then we take the second component that's listed first, which is y2, and remove from it the second component that's listed second in the operation. Now this vector is in R2. That's not what we're trying to question. But now what we want to do is compare these two results. Are they the same? In other words, did the order in which we did the addition, defined in this way, produce the same result? Yes or no? Well, the first components are the same, but the issue is going to be the second components. And these are not the same. So this operation is not commutative. It matters which vector you put first. Let's test the associative property. It's going to turn out that this operation is not associative. And I'm going to give a counterexample. Come up with some easy vectors and perform the operations in the different orders specified here and show you that the results aren't the same. For example, let's let the u be the vector 1, 2. And we're going to special add this to vector v. And I'll say 3, 4 is vector v. And we'll do that first. And then we'll do the special addition to a new vector, which we'll say is 5, 6. OK, so the parentheses suggests we do the addition of the first two vectors. And this special operation adds the first components. So 1 and 3 will add to 4. But it subtracts the second components. We'll do 2 minus 4 and get negative 2. And this is the result of the operation in the parentheses. Now we want to do our special addition with the 5, 6. Well, this operation will add the first components, so we get 9. But subtract the second components, so negative 2 minus 6, 
and we get negative 8. Now let's take these same three vectors, but switch up the order in which we do the, the addition. First vector that's outside of the parentheses, I'll just rewrite 1, 2 in our special addition. And now let's add vector 3, 4 and vector 5, 6. So we add the first components, so we get 8, and then we subtract the second components, so we get 4 minus 6, which is negative 2. And now let's add these two vectors, which means we add the first components and get 9, so that didn't change. But now adding the second components, which means we subtract them, so we do 2 minus negative 2, and that gives me 4. So because we got different results, this tells me the order in which we did the operations was significant. Therefore, we do not have the associative property. Let's look at condition four. Is there a zero object in this set? Well, if there is one that has a chance, it's probably the zero vector. So let's take any, any vector, x, y, and special add the zero vector to it and just see what happens. So we add the first components, it gives me x, and we do y minus zero, we get y, and that's the second component. Well, notice that adding the zero vector to the vector x, y did not change the vector x, y. So this is satisfied. So technically at this point here, we can say that condition four is satisfied the way it is written. But remember, this operation is not commutative. So I'm curious, let's just notice what happens if I try to switch the order. So we do the zero vector and special add that to the arbitrary vector x, y. We add the first components, that gives me x. And then we subtract the second components, but this time we do zero minus y, so we get negative y. And so we don't get the same object this object here, this two-dimensional vector, changes. It's not the same, even though we added the zero vector to it. So if we add the zero in the order mentioned right here, so we take any vector and add it the zero vector, but in this order, it's true that we get that vector back. So this is why technically we're saying that condition four is holding true. But because this operation isn't commutative, you could argue that condition four fails if I were to write it a different way by saying the zero vector special add any vector does not give me that vector back. So if it had been written this way, then we would say condition four fails, but it's not written that way. Again, these ideas are all interconnected. The failure of condition two is what's leading to sort of an inconsistent answer for condition four. But again, the way it's written, the order in which it's written, that did turn out to be true. So we'll say condition four holds. This now test condition five. If I take any vector, x, y, and special add it to what we're going to say is its opposite. If this is vector u, then our goal is to find an opposite of vector u, so that when we do the special addition of these two vectors, we do get the zero vector back. Well, for this to be true, we do need the first component to be the opposite of x, because this addition just combines, in the normal sense, the first components. But we need the second component to not change, because this version of addition subtracts the second components. And so if I'm interested in getting this zero here in the second component, then I need these two components at the bottom to be equal. So we could say that there does exist a negative object, and that negative object is the opposite of only the first component, such that when we do the special addition together, we get the zero object back. And notice if I switch the order of these things and add them in this order, where I put negative u first and u second, Add the first components, we get zero. Subtract the second components, we get zero. So this is a case where we get the zero object back, no matter which order we did the u plus the negative u. Now to test condition five, I only really had to test this first one. And that was sufficient for me to say that condition five holds. It turns out that condition five in reverse order also holds, even though this operation is not generally commutative. So when we say an operation is not generally commutative, doesn't mean that it's always true that u plus v does not equal v plus u. It just means that there are cases where u plus v is not the same thing as v plus u. OK, let's now look at scalar multiplication. So if we do a star any vector u, we'll say that's x, y. This version of scalar multiplication only multiplies the first component by a. But this is still a vector in R2. So it's in our space v. So we will be guaranteed to have closure. Now let's test the distributive property. This one we're going to have to be careful because we have both our unusual scalar multiplication at play and our unusual addition at play. Now to prove a property is true is a little more difficult than proving it's false. To prove that a property is false, we just have to provide one counterexample. Since we don't know if this property will hold, let's aim to try to prove it generally and see what happens. So I'm going to do the two sides of the statement separately and then see if the results are the same or not. 
So we have a scalar a, special times a vector u plus a vector v. We'll say vector u is x1, y1, and we're going to special add that with vector v, which we'll say is x2, y2. So do the inside of the parentheses first. So we still have a special multiply, and then the resulting vector will be x1 plus x2 is the first component, and then y1 minus y2 as the second component. And now we do our special scalar multiplication. So that gives me ax1 plus ax2, the second component, unaffected. So this is the final result of going in this order. Now let's compute this side and see if we get the same thing or not. So we have a special times this vector x1, y1. We'll do that, and then special add it to, and then a special times x2, y2. So performing the operations in the parentheses first. So a times x1, y1, so we get a, x1, but then y1 stays the same. And then we're going to special add this to the result of the second set of parentheses. Again, the a will only multiply to the first component. So we have a, x2, and then y2. And then our special addition operation. We get a new result where the first components add and the second components subtract. So y1 minus y2. And notice that the results here and here are the same. The distributive property 1 holds true. Now let's explore the second distributive property. Let's do the left side of the statement first, which is scalar a plus b with normal addition there because we're just adding scalars. Special scalar multiplication with an object, which is a two-dimensional vector x, y. So special scalar multiplication means that this scalar, which a plus b, will only multiply to the first component. So we get right away a plus b normal multiply with component x and then component y unaffected. So we just have ax plus bx as the first component and y as the second component. And now let's do this side. We have a special multiply with a vector x, y. We'll do that calculation and then we'll do our special addition with another calculation that's b special multiply times the vector x, y. So working inside the parentheses first. The first result will be the vector ax, first component, and y, second component. And we'll special add this to, and then our second set of parentheses calculated will give me bx as the first component, and then y still as the second component. And now when I do special addition, we add the first components like normal, so we have ax plus bx. But we subtract the second components, so we have y minus y, which gives me 0. And this will be the resultant vector. But this time, notice that the two results are not the same. Thus, our distributive property 2 does not hold. And this is our first example of a case where only one of the two distributive properties holds, while the other does not. So they are necessary as distinct properties. Now let's test scalar associativity. We'll do a special multiply, and then parentheses, b special multiply with a vector in R2, so xy. Working inside the parentheses, so we have a special star, and then the resultant vector will be bx in the first component, and then just y in the second component. And when I do the special multiplication once more time, the a will only multiply to the first component, so we'll have abx as the first component, and then just y. So here's the result of doing the left side of the statement. Now let's do the right side and see if we get the same thing or not. So we have the scalar ab, and then special multiply with the vector xy. Well, the scalar in parentheses will special multiply only to the first component. So our first component will be abx, and the second component will just be y. And we do get the same result. So our scalar associativity property holds true. And then lastly, let's test our scalar identity property. So you have 1 and special multiply with the vector xy. Well, that 1 will only multiply to the first component, so it'll stay x, and the bottom will just stay y. But notice, Special multiplying with 1 doesn't change the vector, so we have the scalar identity property holding true. Okay, so looking back, we did have a closure under addition and closure under scalar multiplication as they're defined, but we had some other properties uh, failing, properties 2, 3, and 8, and any one red x will disqualify this from being a vector space. Uh, v is not a general vector space, given these two operations. Okay, let's go to one more page. A subset S of a general vector space V is called a general subspace, or we can just say subspace, of V if the subset S also satisfies the 10 conditions. In fact, 8 of the 10 conditions carry over automatically, leaving only the two closure conditions to be verified. Those closure conditions summarized right here. 
So we do have to verify that the set S is also closed under object addition. So if two objects U and V are in S, then their special sum should be in S as well. And then property six was the closure under scalar multiplication, which is if you take an object in S, then scalar A, special multiply with that object, should still be in S for all scalars A that are real numbers. For each set below, object addition and scalar multiplication are as normal. So set V is a set of all polynomials of degree two or less. And we've already shown on a previous slide that that set V is in fact a vector space. Now set S is equal to AX squared plus BX plus C, where A plus B plus C is equal to zero. So S is also a collection of degree two or less polynomials, but it has an extra condition on the coefficients A, B, and C. So first notice that S is a proper subset of V, which means that there are polynomials in V that are not in the set S, but that every polynomial in the set S also has to be in the set V. So as a Venn diagram is concerned, S would be this circle and V would be a more inclusive circle. An example of something that's in V, x squared plus x plus one, this is a vector that's in V, but if you take all the coefficients and add them together, you don't get zero. You get one plus one plus one. Therefore, this same polynomial is not in S. But an example of a polynomial that is in S would be something like this one, x squared minus two x plus one. This would be in S because its coefficients, one, negative two, and one, add to zero. Okay, so now we've already shown that V is a vector space, and now we want to discuss whether S is also a vector space, but S is a subset. And we're working with the same operations that V had, which in this case are normal object addition and normal scalar multiplication. When, that's, when this is the case, we only have to test for S the closure conditions. And then we can conclude that the other eight conditions will also hold true, hence all 10 conditions will be true, so S will also be a general vector space. Or we can say that S is a general subspace of V, or in short, we can just say that S will be a subspace of V. Okay, let's first test the closure under addition. Let's take two polynomials that are in S. So we'll say P1 is equal to A1x squared plus B1x plus C1. And we're saying that this is in S. What this tells us that in order to be an S, that A1 plus B1 plus C1 has to be zero. Let's take a second polynomial in S, P2. So A2x squared plus B2x plus C2. And this is also in S by assumption, which implies that A2 plus B2 plus C2 also has to be zero. And now let's add them together using normal polynomial addition. So this gives me A1 plus A2, and I can factor the X squared out, plus and then b1 plus b2, and I can factor the x out, and then plus a constant c1 plus c2. Now what we need to do is we want to show that these coefficients add to zero. If we can show that the sum of the coefficients of this resultant polynomial add to zero, that would imply that the resultant polynomial is also in S. All right, so we take these coefficients and add them all together. None of these parentheses is required for a regular addition. We can reorder them because of the commutative properties of a regular addition. And so we can regroup as a1 plus b1 plus c1, and then add to that a2 plus b2 plus c2. But we know that both of those sums separately are zero. So this sum is zero, and this sum is zero. Therefore, these coefficients from the resultant polynomial also add to zero. This tells us that p1 plus p2 is also in S. So we do have closure under addition. Now let's test to see whether S is also closed under scalar multiplication. So let's just take any polynomial, ax squared plus bx plus c, and we're assuming that this is in the set S, which implies that a plus b plus c has to be zero. Now let's take any scalar, and I'll use k instead of a because I already have a dedicated to something else, but here's a scalar times our polynomial. If we distribute the scalar, we're going to get ak times x squared plus bk times x squared plus ck. And once again, we need to show that these coefficients, whether or not they add to zero. If they don't add to zero, then kp is not in s, and this would not be closed under scalar multiplication. But if they do add to zero, then kp will also be in s. So adding the coefficients together, ak plus bk plus ck, we can refactor that k out, 
and have a plus b plus c, but we know that a plus b plus c has to be zero. Therefore, any scalar, including the scalar zero, times a plus b plus c will have to be zero. This tells us that k times a polynomial, any scalar times a polynomial, will still be in S, if that polynomial P was in S to begin with, which gives us closure under scalar multiplication. Now, to be closed under scalar multiplication ensures that we will have the zero object in this set, because one scalar we could choose would be scalar zero, and scalar zero produces a polynomial, produces a second degree polynomial, whose coefficients all add to zero, because the coefficients are all zero to begin with. Also, the closure under scalar multiplication will ensure that every object has an opposite, etc. And then all the other six properties are all true for regular polynomial addition and scalar multiplication. But when working with a subset of a vector space, for that subset, if we can prove that it's closed under addition and closed under scalar multiplication, then all the other properties will fall out as a consequence. And this ensures that S is also a general vector space and in this context, we, we say that S is a general subspace of V. Or you can just leave off the word general and just say S is a subspace of V. Now, if either closure condition failed, then we would say S is not a subspace of V. Okay, and this wraps up our discussion on general vector spaces.